Right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry for the mix up. So, uh, so I'm Adrian. I work at these uh, places. Um, and I, uh, let's see, I, I work on generally medical image analysis with machine learning. Um, and I think as, as has been mentioned, a lot of our focus has been on registration. And, and uh, to a large degree, the reason uh, we're focused on registration is because in my PhD, I had to do a lot of registration uh, and it was enormously painful um, because everything took a very long time. There were all kinds of mistakes, especially when we were working with clinical data. Uh, and so when I got to my postdoc, I started uh, sort of working on how could uh, machine learning help us out. Uh, so this is a slide I was told to put. Uh, I really, really like that they suggested that we list that our institutions are on earth. So I think I'm gonna put that on all my slides from now on. Um, I have no conflicts. All right, so image registration, uh, just to kind of be clear, when I talk about registration, at least I mean aligning uh, two images, warping one image in order to make it fit with the second image in some way. So the, the kind of entity that we're after is this deformation field in the middle. And it can be represented in all kinds of different ways, but you can think of it as a little arrow at every location that tells you how to move one, one image into another. Um, and by the way, since, since, since this talk is a little bit tutorial-ish so that it, it's got this hands-on com component, feel free to stop me and tell me you don't understand what I just said. Um, so registration, as has been alluded, uh, is, is, is incredibly uh, important and it's often swept under the rug. Um, and it's sort of fundamental to all of the packages that we have, packages for analyzing images, packages for tracking inside the MRI scanner, packages for uh, you know, an analyzing in the clinic. Uh, underneath it all, very often you have some registration. Um, and it could be registration to a common template. It could be registration of a previous scan to a current scan. It could be registration before and after surgery. Uh, it's extremely um, sort of widely used. And it's also very, very similar to a lot of other fields. I started my research in sequence alignment in, in biology, and it's really kind of the same problem. Um, and it, because it's such a widely, like a, such an important problem, it has been widely studied. So uh, there's been maybe decades of development of really, really nice mathematical models and, and, and software tools and so on. And this is how all of them work, basically. You, you get your two images and you have some smart model that will wiggle one of them to match up with the other. Um, and that wiggling obviously is important and it's done in a smart, smart way. Um, if, for those of you who like to see a little bit of math, um, we're essentially optimizing this equation. Basically, what, what these algorithms say is I want at the end of the day, two things. I want the two images to match up after they are aligned. So that makes sense. But the other thing I want is I want the deformation to be smooth in some sense. I want it to be anatomically meaningful. I don't want you to do crazy things to the image, stretch it, move it, flip it around. It has to be in some sense regular, right? So these are very intuitive terms and people have over decades developed better ways to match images, better ways to smooth the deformation field, better ways to optimize this whole thing. Um, and so usually, you know, we get like the image on the left uh, we'll call the moving image, we'll get the, the second image, we'll call it the fixed. And what we want is this third column here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, uh, is this third column, as we go through the process, we want it to slowly change from the first image to the second image. Right, so let me show that visualization again. So again, at the beginning, it looks very much like the first image, and over time, we want it to, sorry, to look like the second. So this is kind of the process. And basically every algorithm under the hood, every algorithm that's deployed does this. It gets two images, it says, wow, two images, I've never seen this before. And it starts this kind of crazy process. Um, so the, the, the really awesome thing about this is that there's been just significant development, right? In every sense of the word. Um, but the problem is that it's slow. Every time it gets two new images, it starts the process all over again. All right. So 
learning based machine learning based methods kind of came about a few years ago, maybe four years ago, and they kind of said, let's throw all of that out the window and let's pretend this is a machine learning problem. I'm given an input to images and I want an output, which is a deformation field. So we could just put a black box in the middle and make it work. Uh, and that sounds good. At the beginning, we looked, uh, people did a lot of these uh, problems in a supervised way. So what that meant was that they had to get some ground truth deformation fields, right? So maybe you get 10,000 images from somewhere, you register them all with a classical model, you wait a month, you get your data, and now you're going to train a black box to simulate that process. So that was sounded simple enough, um, but it was very cumbersome. Right. Every time you had a new problem, you had to go through this whole thing and um, it would take a long time and uh, the machine learning was clunky. And so about two and a half years ago, uh, we got interested in this problem, but we wanted to do it in what's called an unsupervised way. So we didn't want any ground truth. We just wanted a way to look at the data and say, well, over time, as I register data, I should be able to have learned something about the data. And so by the time I have to register my 100th pair, it should be a simpler problem. Um, and so the, the big advantage of these systems is that they will be really, really fast. Now, the fact that it's fast is good. It's good when you deploy, it's good in the clinic, it's good in analysis. But what was really interesting to me is that because it was fast, all of a sudden I could, um, we could explore models of analysis that we just couldn't do before because of the wait times, right? So we, we could extract better features and build better models and track patients better and so on and build sophisticated models because everything was faster. But okay, so this is kind of what the machine learning models did. So let me, let me kind of go a little bit in detail here. And the reason I'm going in detail here is because the hands-on session that, um, or the hands-on tutorial, which I will kind of touch halfway through, but also you will have access to afterwards, um, kind of, you know, does go a little bit into neural networks. And so it's, it's not overly complicated, but I just want to uh, explain the details a little bit. So, okay, you have, um, you have two images and there is this sort of neural network you have to build and you want to get your deformation field out. Now, the details don't matter, but what, what really matters is that um, you can use anything you want here as long as it takes a big input and it spits out a big output. So the dominant way to do that is with uh, an architecture called units that changes all the time. It doesn't really matter. As long as you have some architecture like that, you can get it to take into images and to output a deformation field. So that's easy. The thing that's interesting is how do we train this? How do we teach the network how to register? So if you do it in a supervised way, if you have ground truth data, if you have a ton of image pairs and the ground truth deformation field, then it's pretty easy. You just, every time the network gives you a deformation field, you say, no, it should have been this other thing. So compute the error and try to learn. But if you don't have ground truth deformation fields, what do you do? And so we thought this is an excellent opportunity to learn from all those decades of development because there's all these mathematicians and physicists that have developed ways to, to, to evaluate whether, whether a deformation field is good, right? And it was basically that very simple equation. Sorry. It was, it was basically that very simple equation that said, well, a deformation field is good if it aligns the two images and if it's regular in some way, right? And so this is what we took from the classical methods. And we said, we're going to use this when we train a neural network, right? Of course, now we're not optimizing a deformation field. What we're optimizing is a whole neural network. And this neural network has to work for any image pair. And it has to, you know, if there's big differences or small differences or the brains are sideways or something, it has to work. And so what we do is we give the network all possible image pairs uh, in all the data that you can gather. And you tell it, every time it gives you a deformation field, you say, well, this deformation field is no good because it doesn't match my image pairs or it's not smooth. And that's all the information 
you have. And the network kind of back propagates and updates its, its parameters with that. And so it's, a, it's an example of how you can marry um, sort of technology from the new neural network or machine learning world with kind of all the classical backbones that we have over decades of development, in this case, by taking the loss functions that they've developed um, and using those to teach our neural networks about what is a good registration. And so the approach I presented here is, is uh, called voxel morph. It's, it's sort of our, um, our uh, sort of research into this field. It's, it's currently a, a po popular package to do registration. Um, the way we actually do it is we implement all of this in the neural network framework. So the loss is also implemented in neural networks and they appear as layers and so on. But what matters is that at the end of the day, we teach a neural network how to register data without ever needing to know what the ground truth is, just by kind of telling it what's good and what's bad. All right, um, I'm gonna skip this. So at the end of the day, what do you have? You have a neural network that can take in two images and give you the deformation field in one shot. Okay. Um, so let me just give you the highlights of what this means. The most important thing is uh, you have to train this, right? So it takes, let's say a day to train. Now, of course, not, you don't have to train these if your data is very similar to the data we trained on, you can just download the model. But if you really wanna train your own, day, your own model, it takes about a day to train. Um, but the big question, the big thing we were after is how good is, how, how fast is this model? And so he, the first two columns here, um, the first two bars are classical models that are by far, in our experience, the best models out there. They really underlie a lot of the analysis software that people use. And to register one image pair, it takes about two hours with ants or tens of minutes with nifty reg. Okay, the Y column should say seconds. The advantage that we were really excited about is that with voxel morph, it was under a minute to register an image. Um, and that was on a CPU. If you had a GPU, it was under a second. So this was really cool because uh, when we were done with this, we wanted to do, for example, a, a, an analysis on uh, to do a GWAS study in genetics. And we had to process 10,000 images almost. And we did it over lunch. Right? Uh, and that was just mind boggling because when I was in my PhD, it would take us a few months to do that. OK, so that changed the game. But well, well, what, as I said, what I was really excited is to see, OK, what can we do with this? now that um, you know, we have this neural network approach to registration. Um, so to convince you that this works, I'm just gonna say, uh, well, we did a lot of analysis. How do you know whether you've registered well or not? Uh, you can't just look at the images, although I think it's tempting to do that, right? You take an image, you warp it, and then you say, well, does it match? But you don't know if it did that by warping in a, in a sane way, or if it kind of stretched and uh, you know, flipped the image or something, right? Your right hippocampus might be your left hippocampus now, you don't know. And so the way you fix this is um, to, to kind of make sure you do things right, is you label a bunch of things on both images, you register them, and now you look at how well those uh, pieces of anatomy that you've labeled, how well do they match up? Um, and so in this example that I have here, you know, the moving scan and the fixed scan, we have labeled some structures. And then after we warp the moving scan, they match up with the fixed scan really well. That's kind of the, the qualitative way to analyze registration. You can look at all kinds of quantitative ways. And the bottom line real, really is that these machine learning approaches um, were very good at performing as well as the classical models. So at, at first, we didn't really necessarily see crazy improvements in accuracy, but we did see you know, two orders of magnitude speed up. So that was enough to kind of uh, kickstart a bunch of projects on this. Uh, and one more thing I want to mention, because I get this asked this all the time in a clinical scenario, which is, well, if I have my own data, 
my own clinical data, um, well, first of all, does it work equally well? And we have uh, projects that show that it does, but what's important is, um, do I need thousands of data to train? Because that's what I hear about deep learning. And we did a bunch of analysis on this and we showed that basically um, you only need 25, 50 images to train. And in fact, it's even less than that nowadays with sort of fancier ways to train. Um, if you only have say 10 images or five images, you're not going to perform as well as if you waited the two hours to register images with the classical method. But this machine learning method will still give you a very, very good initialization. So it'll almost do the job, but it won't be perfect. Um, so you can always take that result and optimize that a little bit. Okay, so what does all this mean? So the promises that we were really excited about was that uh, this method is really fast, right? And so it provides a way to iterate over research really fast, provides a way for uh, you know, use in the clinic and in analysis. Um, there's all kinds of advantages uh, from a sort of mathematical point of view. You get stuck a lot less um, than you do with the classic models, things like that. Um, but what we're really uh, excited about is that this enabled us to build better templates that um, I have a few slides on. Um, it enables us to be build very robust tools. So the previous talk um, mentioned the challenges of cross, um, you know, cross data center, cross acquisition, and having a model that works across all of them. Uh, I have a few slides kind of explaining how we can get our models to be extremely robust to that, basically. Uh, working on all kinds of data, all kinds of MRI acquisitions, all kinds of modalities and contrasts and so on. Um, we uh, have a model called Hypermorphs that enables you to avoid the need to tune hyperparameters. So for basically any tool that you will use, oftentimes you will need to tune something to kind of make it work with your data. And um, every time you tune it, you have to wait a little to, for the model to adjust or retrain or uh, re-optimize or something. And so we avoid the need to re-optimize or retrain. We, we can provide a way to do everything in real time. Now, I know I started late. Um, and so what I'd like to ask um, is whether, so I have a few slides on all of these projects to kind of explain how they work and the advantages they bring. But I also have um, a sort of tutorial that's organized in Google Colab that people can go through. And I'm happy to kind of bring it up on the screen. Um, it's, it, we've organized the tutorial in such a way that if you have Python experience, you can play around with it and kind of modify things. If you don't have Python experience, then you can just sort of read through it and it will give you a good intuition about how these models work, where they break, and so on. Um, so I'm wondering if someone could comment on, you know, where we should go from here, just given that we started so late. Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe uh, we can go a little bit over time, I hope, um, because, you know, there were some technical issues. I, right. I would love, I think many people would love to see uh, the um, collab, because I think that really puts the technology in the hands of the, of the persons. Sure. So, um, so the, the collab is at that address, uh, mritogether.boxmore.net. Um, and it's kind of split into these four parts. The first one, we do core concepts with MNIST. So MNIST is this data set of digits. Um, and it's really just to give an idea of how things work. And then uh, we have this 2D brain MRI as an example, then a 3D brain MRI then some bonus kind of more high level, um, sorry, advanced stuff on like how to build your own templates, for example. So let me, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen for one second so that I can, uh, I can just bring up that website, okay? Um, and again, feel free to, you know, go there yourself. Uh, it should work for everybody, I hope. And yeah, obviously, if it doesn't work, please. <laughs> the link seems to be working. Right. Okay. 
Um, I guess I should, um, I don't know, if anybody has questions, feel free to interrupt. I know I maybe did that a little quicker than usual just because the time, but. Not, um, okay. So, so, and you know, I'm not a hundred percent sure to be honest how to do this at what pace to do this. If we kind of go one line by line, it will take, you know, a long time. <laughs> um, it is a pretty sizable um, uh, tutorial, um, but. Um, I think you can go, you can go quick because people can go back to the collab and then, you know, figure it out. It, I think it doesn't have to be like very okay. too much hand holding, maybe. Okay. So, um, you know, one of the great things about these uh, is that the, so I've run everything once, I've run everything a few times. And so you can just see the outputs. Um, so the first a little bit is just uh, setting up the environment. The one thing I will highlight here is that, so as I said, we maintain this, um, this project called Voxelmorph. You can very easily install it by just saying pip install Voxelmorph, which is the main way to install anything in Python. But um, you know you don't have to worry about GitHub and these sort of things if you if you want to just quickly get started. If you are a coder and you, if you have GitHub experience and all that stuff, you can get the latest uh, code where we usually have our kind of latest papers and so on and everything uh, latest features. Um, all right, so. One thing I will mention. So um, the data um, is uh, the very at the very beginning. We're going to deal with MNIST. MNIST is this very simple data set used widely in machine learning. For a lot of machine learning people, it's the only data set that exists, um, and it's basically a bunch of digits that people have written. Um, and here we're just taking the digit five. And so I'm, I'm doing this just to kind of illustrate what registration is about, right? So you can imagine how registering one five to another is possible and it kind of tells you how things work, right? Um, so a little bit about if you download a machine learning package, I don't know what kind of how much experience people have, but 90% um, of the time when you're gonna start, get stuck is because the data isn't processed in some way. And so, we go through a bunch of cells here where I try to um, kind of explain here's the things you usually have to deal with when you download data. So things like normalizing the data and you know making sure visualizing it and making sure it makes sense and that sort of thing. Splitting up your data sets a little bit so that you don't accidentally kind of train on your test set and that sort of thing. Okay, so there's a, there's a bit of that there. Um, okay, so let's look at how Voxomorph actually works. Um, so I very carefully, uh, I, I try to be careful here in explaining every part of the, of, of kind of how the networks are built, just so you understand what happens. Um, but what we describe is how you can use a unit that, um, I think some of the others presented presenters use. Um, and the main idea of this architecture is that you have a bunch of layers where you downsample the image at different scales so that you can extract different features at different scales. And then you build up um, uh, the architecture kind of back up to the resolution you want to make your prediction. So for us, um, this unit will take in two uh, images and it will have this many kind of features at, at every level. So 32 features down sampling, 32 features down sampling, 32 features, and then it comes back up. Um, and uh, we sort of, you know, talk about how to, and, and so at the, um, at the very end, you take, you take the output of your, of your unit and you say, well, with the latest features, what we'd like to do is create a deformation field, right? And that's because that's what I want in registration. Like given two images, you want to put a deformation field. So I have one more layer at the end of my network that outputs a 2D field. So at every location, it outputs, uh, in, in case of 2D registration, it outputs a 2D arrow that tells me how to move that location, right? Does that make sense so far? Please do interrupt if you, if you have any questions. Um, so this is sort of the part that does that. Now, the other uh, important part of a model is the loss. 
Um, so I describe here kind of in parallel to my uh, talk, I, I describe here what a supervised loss tends to be and what an unsupervised loss tends to be. In our case, most of the time we deal with unsupervised losses. And so it's made of these two parts. One of them says, well, warp the image, warp the moving image and check how close it is to the fixed, right? And so uh, what we need to do here is take the transformation, take the moving image and actually move, use the transformation to move the image, okay? Um, and then we, we set up the actual losses that says, okay, now that you have the warped image, make sure it looks or encourage it to look like the fixed image by using something simple in our case, mean squared error or something like that, right? You just take the difference between the warped and the fixed and you penalize that difference. Um, so that's, that's what this part does. Um, the, and then there's of course a second loss. We don't kind of go into this too much, but uh, the second loss just kind of tries to make sure that the deformation field is smooth, right? So it doesn't do any uh, kinky things. Um, now people have worked a lot on, on how to make it smooth. We just give a very simple uh, loss here. All right, so that's kind of the setup, right? Um, and then there's a question always about tuning a parameter, right? Which one matters more, the smoothness or the image matching term? And that's, you know, that's a, a, always a challenge. Is, a, is there a question here? Yes, there's a question. Let me read it. Um, Right, does the, input, uh, does the input data have to be pre-processed? And if so, what are the steps? So at the very beginning, we took every lesson from classical work, which, and, and there's a substantial amount of work classically on how to normalize your data. As the previous speaker also discussed, right? How do we do intensity normalization? Maybe in our case, you might want a skull strip. You might want to, um, you know, make sure they're kind of like run roughly aligned. Everyone's looking in the same direction and that sort of thing. Now, that's what we did at first, right? And so in that case, you, you do need that. Um, you do need these steps. We used FreeSurfer, which is, uh, you know, fairly well-known piece of software to analyze um, uh, brain images. But um, what we actually learned over time is that the kind of the exact opposite is true of neural networks. If we train neural networks with very, very, very specific data that has been cleaned up, that's what it will work on. But um, we have since published models where we actually say, let's try the opposite. Let's try teaching a network to deal with very complicated data, very noisy data, you know, data with the neck, the skull, data with different modalities and so on. Now, it's a little more challenging to train those models. But if you are able to train them, then they are that much more powerful because at test time, you don't need to do any of the pre-processing, right? Um, you know, it would take a bit of time to explain how we get the models to be robust, but kind of the, the main takeaway is that during training, you can kind of do creative things at input as long as the output is on the simple things. Right? So you can imagine I take an image, I skull strip it, blah, blah, blah. But I don't give the clean image to the network. I give the original image to the network. The only time I use my clean image is in the loss function. The advantage of that is that the network never sees clean images. It always sees these complicated, noisy, you know, clinical quality data. Um, and therefore, it, it learns how to deal with that. Okay, I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, Please let me know. What we show in the tutorial is, is sort of the simple version, right? Where you will train on very clean data and you will, um, you will test on very clean data. But we've gone beyond that now. Okay. Um, so, you know, we had just kind of uh, written the loss functions and um, we have to balance there. So when we train the model, we have to tell the model how much do we care about each of the loss functions. Since then, again, we've had papers where um, we actually, it turns out you don't need to decide this before you train. Um, and that's a paper called Hypermorphic. Um, we have a separate tutorial for that uh, for anyone who wants. 
Okay, so now you've set up everything, set up your model, you've set up your loss functions, you need to train. And training is pretty simple. You need to write in Python what is called a generator. The idea is you have a bunch of data and you want some function that from that bunch of data just samples two images and gives it to the network. That's all. Now you could get creative. You could sample the images and add noise just to make the network slide hard. That would make it more robust. You could sample the images and flip one of them upside down again to make the network learn how to deal with these things. But in this, um, in this case here, we just grab two images. We randomly say, okay, give me one random image, give me another, feed these two to the network. Now, this is what it looks like. Um, before we do anything with the model, right? Here's the, the, the moving image, here's the fixed image, right? So it's just two simple fives. And this is what we would like this warped image to look like, right? So we would like this image to slowly warp and look like the fixed image. So we want it to look like this. Okay, now we do some fake training here, um, meaning we train you know, for just 10 epochs or something. Now, when you train a model, you'll need to train it for longer, but you know, we, we train it for just 10 epochs, 10 iterations, if you will. Here's kind of what happens to our joint loss function. So it's going down, right? The images match a little better and deformation fields are smooth, so that's good. And now the question is, how does it look like when we actually try to use this model? Now, uh, we go through a few lines to explain how to do that. You need to grab some data, hopefully some new data that the model has never seen. And then you kind of have to tell the model, okay, here's two images, give me the, the, the formation. So here's what happens. Now, remember this model has only been trained with 10 iterations, okay? It, it hasn't really fully been trained, but just as a, an illustration. Here is the moving image. Here's the fixed image. Remember, these are randomly taken from a, a population of fives. And then the moving image, when it's warped, it looks like this. Now, this isn't perfect, right? It doesn't look perfectly like this image, but it's pretty good actually, considering we only trained the model for very little, right? It kind of looks like this image. And here, what we're showing is the warp, um, only one dimension of the warp, right? And so what we want to see in these images is that it's somewhat smooth, right? We don't want some crazy kind of like black and then white, which would mean like very negative and then very positive. That would mean that there's some part of the image where it's being stretched or something. But this is kind of just this very smooth deformation field. So what this is telling us is that it takes this five and it just kind of, you know, a little bit massages it to look like this. It's kind of what we want. It's not perfect, but it's getting there. Um, okay, I hope this makes sense. Um, we can also uh, look at the deformation field in, a, you know, we can look at the arrows. So this is kind of a nice way to see, you know, how it's kind of pulling very slowly, right? These are all little arrows, they have little arrowheads. And so again, it's it's somewhat smooth. It's kind of the, the takeaway that you want here. So you can imagine when you have uh, you know, a whole brain, it's helpful to look at these to kind of see, oh, the ventricle is being expanded, you know, that sort of thing. Now, um, there's always an important question on how the, uh, how the, the, the model will work on data that it's never seen not just fives in our case, but what if we give it something else? What if we give it sevens? Okay, now that's, that's an interesting question. It's never seen a seven, okay? Um, but it turns out that it actually kind of works decently, right? You take this seven, try to warp it to this seven. Now, this is actually a difficult problem because this seven has this little thing at the front, this one doesn't. So, you know, it's not an easy seven to seven registration. What the model does is pretty reasonable, right? It takes this thing, it kind of tries to collapse the little frontier, it tries to expand the seven, and this is what it looks like, right? Kind of similar to the fixed, it's not bad, right? Now, 
what's the lesson here, right? The model worked on sevens, but it's only ever seen fives. So what does this mean? Well, maybe if it sees healthy brains, it'll work on brains with Alzheimer's. You know, maybe that's fine. But let's look at a different example. What happens if these fives, what we did here is we took the same fives as before, but we just multiplied the intensity by two. Okay, very simple. It's the same five, but it's seeing intensities that it's never seen. And it turns out that then it completely collapses. Right? And that's a property of neural networks. If, if they see intense, so all that neural networks do is they take the intensities you give them and they manipulate the intensities to give you a deformation field. So if you give it different intensities, now all of a sudden you've really screwed up with what they can do, right? I've doubled the intensities and all of a sudden everything's gone haywire. So this is why it's really important to know your data, right? And you know, to the question that I was asked, if you train in a regime from where your data is normalized from zero to one, it's really not going to work outside of that. Okay, so hopefully that this horrible registration convinces you of that. All right, so that's been, you know, that's a registration with digits, which is not the most useful thing in the world. Now we provide a data set for you to play with. Um, it's using data from the OASIS uh, study, which, um, you know, obviously we're not the ones that have gathered it. OASIS very graciously is a very open data set, so a lot of people can use it. Um, and here's a bunch of brains, okay? These are T1 and PRH, they're skull script in this case, again, to make our tutorial easier. Um, they're normalized for the most part. Um, we do have some, you know, healthy and some neurodegenerative disease cases. No. So um, as with MNIST, we kind of have to go through the same process. We build the model, we prepare it, we build our little generator that samples brains. You know, we visualize our brains because we want to make sure we don't make, uh, you know, the images are not crazy or something. We train our model, right, as before. Here, we're just training five epochs. And then I make a note, five epochs with brains, with real data is nothing, right? So if you're going to just wait you know, one minute or five minutes to train your model, it's nowhere near enough. If you're looking at 2D slices of brain, you really want to wait an hour before your models are useful, right? So what we do instead is we load some weights that, some, some models that we've prepared for the, for the data set, uh, sorry, for the tutorial. Now, how does this model work? All right, let's look at it. So here's the moving image. Here's the fixed image. Now, you know, if, if you're a, a person who knows your anatomy, then you probably already know more than I do. But, um, you know, let's look at some features here, right? So on this person, the ventricles, at least on this slice, are bigger than for this person, right? We would really like the model to know that and to kind of shrink the ventricles, if you will, right? Um, and so it does that, right? This is the moved image. This is taking this image and trying to fit it here. So it does indeed take these ventricles and shrinks them. Now, how can you actually tell what happened? Well, you can often look at the flow field and you can look here and it's a positive, this white area that basically says, okay, the ventricles are being, um, this tissue here is being pushed up, right? Here there's dark, it's telling you, okay, this tissue here is being pushed down, right? So this ventricle is kind of being closed to match this image and that, right, the flow field is what we end up analyzing later, right? How are the flow fields between different populations? How are people that have a certain disease different than others and so on? So the model works. Now, the really nice thing about this is that we just gave it two images and we pushed, pushed it through the model and it come, came out. And this takes a fraction of a second, right? In fact, I don't know, um, maybe here somewhere uh, I had a, a timer, but basically, in 2D, it's really a fraction of a second. It's, it's instant, right? Um, and you know, 2D registration would take a few minutes uh, classically. This is another way to look at the deformation field. Again, we can see that it's mostly smooth. It's not, it doesn't do anything really crazy. Um, how do we know if deformation fields, uh, if, if um, uh, you know, this works really well? So, 
I give you, I give you an example of how um, you could, by just looking visually at the image, you might not, or looking at how well the images match up, you might get the wrong idea. So this is the, the, the sort of fixed image. And this is the worked image from before, right? This image here. Now it looks okay, right? But it's not perfect. And the error is 0 0.01. Okay, that's, that's how different they are in, in some measures. Now, if you force the algorithm to really, 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 really care about how well the image is mapped, it will do that. And it will achieve a lower number, okay? This is lower, right? It's, it's almost half, 0 0.0007 compared to 0 0.0011, right? So it's, it's a better match. But to do that, it had to do some crazy things. You can see that around the cortex, it had to sort of basically collapse the, the gray matter because you know it didn't quite see the gray matter here. So you know it, it, it did these very kind of weird stretch of tissues and so on. And so is this a better registration than this? I wouldn't say so, but the images at least in terms of numbers are better. But you know, you look at the deformation field and you can tell hey, there's a problem here, right? There's these kind of crazy flips between black and white, meaning it's, it, there's these stretches. So at least there's an alarm now. Um, I know there's a couple of questions. Let me just finish my point, um, which, oops. Um, uh, maybe I don't have an example of this. So what, what, I, what, what I try to sell here is that it, there's a bunch of things that matter in registration and one way to actually evaluate it is to use annotations. Now, let me see what the, let me see what the chat is. Yeah, that's that's not a question. It's just oh, okay. uh, the comments okay. that it, that you continue what you're doing. It's amazing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great, great, great. Um, so I I guess I should also mention that we have a series of tutorials. This is one of them. I I kind of put it together for this workshop, but we have a series of tutorials where we go slightly more in depth in these uh, in these aspects. Okay, so once we've done this with two D, the question is, what's the big deal about going to three D? It's really not. You know, it's really not, um, conceptually, there's no difference. So um, you set up the, you know, you do everything else the same. You set up the model and, and so on. But the problem is now you're dealing with 3D data. And so if you're going to train this, a word of warning, you need big GPUs and you need to wait a long time. Originally, when we did this, it's about a day. But that is a day of training when you have images that are well uh, normalized and well prepared, right? Now that's fine, but in a lot of scenarios, you don't want to require that. You want to be robust, especially in the clinic where you know patients can move and your you know uh, slice thickness is bad and all these sort of things. So instead, we can't quite train a model here, right? It's it's this free thing that Google gives us. We can't run this for a day. Um, and so we're going to give you a bunch of models. We have a bunch of models that we've already trained for brain MRI. So we're going to load that. Now let's look at data. Um, so an important part of 3D data is to look at it in all dimensions. Now I know that sounds silly, of course, you know, look at it, you know, it's 3D, but um, we do see an awful lot of people who analyze and, you know, they're used to seeing the axial direction and, and, and they only check that. Uh, but the problem is these models, depending on how they're trained, they can fail in ways that you can't see um, because, you know, learning, uh, machine learning models are not, they're not necessarily doing exactly what you think they're doing. And so remember, you know, you give the data that's, that's twice, in, twice in intensity and all of a sudden everything's garbled up. And so the reason I say all this is you need to check, visualize as much as you can. So please visualize all of the directions. Um, we load the model, uh, we warp the images. Now, going back to this question of how do we know if the, if the algorithm did well? We could look at the images. It would look very similar to the 2D images from before. What we really want to do is to see how well the deformations, the, um, sorry, how well segmentations of the brain are warped. Now, of course, you're not gonna have segmentations for all your data, but hopefully you have some annotation for a little bit of your data. 
because if you are warping the annotations, then those are really hard to cheat on. Right. If you're warping the brain, you can cheat. You can take some black from the background and put it in the middle of the ventricle, and you're not going to know. But if you take some background and put it in the middle of the ventricle in the segmentation map, you will know. Right. And so when you verify your algorithm to make sure it works, I recommend you take your label map or even just you know, putting some points on the image and then applying the deformation field and see if the anatomy matches. So here's an example. Here's the moving label map. Here's the fixed label map. These are label maps from free server. And then when I warp the moving image, I can see that the anatomies mostly match up, right? So, you know, the, the white matter and the gray matter and, you know, the, I, I don't know if I need to go through all the structure. Um, you know, they all kind of uh, match up. Now, you know, if you did something crazy, like for example, if you flip the brain left and right, in intensity world, you wouldn't know, or maybe a very, very experienced radiologist would know, but you know, most people, most of us wouldn't. Um, but here you would be able to tell because if you labeled your left hippocampus and your right hippocampus different, you would immediately be able to tell if something went wrong. So, most of the time we evaluate how well our algorithms do by having this external annotation. Now, I know, you, you know you're not gonna sit there and annotate the hippocampus and all your brains, but at least kind of keep this in mind, right? When, when you evaluate these algorithms. Now, uh, running this takes, oh, so I do have runtime. Okay, so uh, running this on a 3D image is a second. Now this is on a very, very slow free Google server, right? Um, so if you, um, if you did it on your own GPU, um, nowadays for us, it takes maybe, I don't know, a quarter of a second or something like that, right? For a full 3D volume. Again, I will remind you in my PhD, it took two hours. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are. Now, one last kind of bonus thing I included here. I, one of the things I, 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 uh, get asked all the time and so it got really excited is building templates. So it's very simple. Um, a lot, when you wanna do some analysis, right? You have a thousand brains or something and you want to analyze you know, some correlation or something. The way we usually do it is we warp uh, the images to some common reference frame from which we can analyze everybody. Underneath the hood, this is what your favorite algorithms do as well. FreeSurfer, for example, aligns all your data to an atlas. That's great. The problem is, what if you don't have an atlas that represents your data, right? A lot of times we have this scenario where you might have patients who are, let's say 20 years old and the best atlas available to you is of 80 year old Alzheimer's patients. That doesn't work out. And so people always ask, okay, well, this is great. Can I build my own atlas? And there's a lot of work on how to build your own atlases, but it's very, very slow. If you thought registration was slow, two hours, building an atlas is another order of magnitude slower. The reason is very simple. You, how do you build an atlas? You take all your data, you average it, and then you do this process where you take all your data, you register it to that average and average again. That makes it a little better. And you register again, average again, makes it a little better. Two months later, you have an atlas. Now, that's how it used to be done. Voxelborg can help, right? Because we can register things faster. But we had this idea, I'm not gonna go into it, but um, you know, you have these two images that you give to the, to, the, to the network, right? If you're registering to an atlas, then one of them is an atlas, one of them is an image. Okay, simple enough. But what happens if you don't have an atlas? Could we just tell the network, hey, learn the atlas? And it turns out you can. All you have to do is you tell the network, I actually don't know what the values of the pixels are. You figure it out because it's a very, you know, it's a well-defined problem. Figure out what the value should be such that it matches all the images as well as it can. Um, so this is, we, I walk people through this here, right? So we load up MNIST again, um, just because it's easier. And um, we prepare the model. It's the same as Voxelmore, the exact same thing. The only change will be that instead of giving an image, I'm gonna tell the network to learn what that image should be. 
at the same time as training everything. Okay. Um, and so it's a little bit of coding to, to do that. And then I train it, it looks like this. And then this is what happens. This is what comes out. So the model now has learned two things. It's learned to register five, but it's learned also what is the best five to which it should register two, right? So that means every time I give it a five, it will try to register it to this five because it thinks this five is the most kind of central five, if you will, right? It's not blurry. That's the nice thing, right? It's not this kind of blurry average of all the fives. It's a five. It's a sharp, nice five. And you will admit it's not an extreme five, right? It's not too big, too small, too stretched or anything. It's a nice looking five. Now, this is great. You know, we got really excited about this. We ran it on brains. It gave us some nice brain images. It was great. But we realized we can do a lot more with this because one of the challenges in MRI is you don't have really 20 year olds only. Most of the time you have a population of people. They might be different ages, different sexes. They might have different genetic um, uh, you know, things that you're looking for, ge genetic variants you're looking for. Maybe they're, you have healthy and, and controls. So what you really wanna do is build some entity, some athlete that somehow represents this entire population. Now, the way people usually do it is they will build a bunch of atlases. They'll build a healthy atlas, the disease atlas, the 20 year old atlas, the 50 year old atlas, you know, you'll have all these proliferation of atlases. That works, but the problem is, what if you have a 20 year old atlas and a 30 year old atlas and you have a 25 year old patient? Where does that person go? So what we thought was, okay, we have this powerful engine. Now. We have this powerful machine learning thing. Could we avoid learning atlases at all, but instead learn a function that gives you an atlas depending on what you want? So now let's say you have a 24 year old female with some disease with a particular genetic makeup. Can I get the atlas specific to that person, right? And if I can, then I compare my patient that has exactly these characteristics to that atlas. That enables me to see how different they are, right? Are, is their brain aging faster? Is there some other difference? And so that's what we kind of wrote a paper on and, and we walked through here. It's called, an, um, so we have unconditional templates where you, we just build brains, but um, conditional templates. So these are templates that are conditioned on the variables you care about. So here we walk through um, different types of, of conditions. Um, with the digits, the condition you might want is the digit, right? So instead of building 10 atlases, what we did here is we built a single network that responds to different inputs. So we could say a one, and it gives us, it gives us the de template for one. We say three, and it gives us the template for a three. Um, oh no, I think I, I don't have the, <laughs> I don't have the, I sold it and I don't think I have the, the brain one here. I apologize, but I will bring up a slide that does it. Uh, so give me one second. I think I ran out, of, uh, ran out of time, but let me show you. So this, this is in the tutorial, but it's, um, it's only for MNIST. But here is a conditional template video, right? So. This is a brain that is changing with age, right? So you can see that, you know, the ventricles are expanding and the brain is atrophying and it's a really sad video really. But the point is that the algorithm has learned these effects. And the only, like, the only thing we did is we took voxel morph and we told the algorithm, we're not gonna tell you what the atlas is for this person. You have to tell me what the atlas is. All I'm telling you is what the age is. And it learns for every age, and I don't mean you know for five different age groups, but for every age at, at uh, you know high precision, what that atlas should be. Um, so we walked through that in the tutorial, um, but apparently I only show it for MNIST. I can I can add to that tutorial to show the brains as well. Um, and that's it. I will mention that, uh, again, we have other tutorials for other things. So there's a hypermorph that I promised where the idea is that um, you don't have to tune things and then retrain and tune and retrain and tune and retrain. 
um, which is really, really cool. Here's a cool visualization of that. So, um, you know, here's a moving image, here's a fixed image. And the idea is that um, you can just, oh, I don't know if I, can I play this? Play this. Sorry, it's a video, but for some reason I can't play it maybe. Um, Sorry, I will end in one second. I know I'm keeping everybody over, but just wanted to show this um, because we do have tutorial, we do have hands-on for this as well. So here's here's somebody tuning. Um, can you can you see this video? People can see this video. So this is somebody yep, tuning tuning the registration parameter live, and the network is responding to that knob and saying, okay, if this moving image, if you if you only care about matching the image, here's what that looks like. If you only care about having a smooth field, here's what it looks like. And you as the, as the scientist or the radiologist or something have control over what is the appropriate hyperparameter. Now, this might seem like a simple thing, I think, because we try to make it simple, but what you would normally do to tune this is for every value you wanna try, you would train different models for days and then you would try the different models and you would only have those five and whatever. This allows you to tune this in real time with infinite precision. Um, and I think uh, that's it. The only other kind of project we have a tutorial on is, is this project where we basically simulate endless amount of data so that we make our model completely robust to modality and image type and um, you know, diseases and all that sort of stuff. So we have some of these models here that we train for months and they will just work on any brain image you give it. Um, but that's it. I think I will end there because I probably run way too long. Thank you. Adrian, thank you so much for this. I mean, the, the, the topic of this workshop is open, open science and reproducible research. And you just, you know, practiced that and showed us and gave us the tools you use so we can use them. This is amazing. Thank you very much. We ran a bit over time, but I think it's totally worth it. I'm very grateful. Uh, and yeah, I think we'll leave it there. Uh, but thank you very much for your for your talk. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you.